this justice? It's a hot topic today, and frankly, it's, it's a hot topic a, a lot of the time. Is justice something liberating, or is it something that in liberating condemns others who, who don't agree? As the author Alcidire McIntyre asks in his second book on morality, whose justice? Which morality? Now, McIntyre is worth reading in his entirety, but beware, he is really, really dense. The best resource that I've found that kind of summarizes his thought is, frankly, just from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. In a Catholic understanding, justice is all about right relationships about rendering to an other what is right based on their own dignity. Of course, today this often means trying to get others to live kind of the same bourgeois, middle-class lifestyle as everyone else. And this becomes a problem because the contraceptive and abortive mentality actually undermines the dignity of the unborn and the children and ultimately of the contracepting husband and wife by relegating children to commodities of convenience and spouses to objects of lust and personal fulfillment, not love and growth in charity. So if justice is about right relationship with others, we can see that it has many different aspects. For example, with the self, it would be understood as humility. With others, should be understood as distributive and commutative justice, not communism. Family, classically known as filial piety. If you've ever read the Aeneid, you get pious Aeneas over and over, pious Aeneas. It's because it's about family. To the greater community, known as patriotism and citizenship, and to God, which is known as the virtue of religion. Notice that these understandings of justice are never related to ideas, but to people. In a sense, we could talk about justice towards everything that's created calling it stewardship in a, in a strict sense. And so, abusing created things does not treat them as their dignity as created things. So, for example, if we abuse animals or, or plants, that's vicious behavior. If you're beating a dying horse, it's probably not the right thing to do because it's causing undo pain for pain's sake, and that's wrong. And yet, just as with all virtues, there are two sides of the vice. The other side would be idolatrizing creation as the only good out there, or exalting creation as a good in and of itself, instead of a good that is ordered towards the good of the human person. This is where we get signs that say, plants are people too. Or another one that a priest friend of mine has on his fridge that someone gave him as a joke, dogs are people too. So of course we see with any virtue that is with justice, it most often exists between two vices that are the far sides that are, are not quite there. Thus one can be towards oneself too harsh, be shamefulness, or to think too highly of oneself as if we were God, I can do anything, and that would be called pride. Or let's look at the understanding of justice in regards to the greater community, not only the city, but we could also say, in a sense, to the nation, called citizenship. The vices would be, on one side, anarchism. And on the other side, 
immoderate nationalism, which most often goes as jingoism or chauvinism. At the beginning of the Mass, when we came in, there were so many psalms. I often pray a psalm as I'm coming into church, Psalm 42. Defend me, O God, and plead my cause, and I will come to the altar of God, the God who gives joy to my youth. When I looked at the Missal, there are two sets of psalms that are about this thick, so thick, so much. We heard a psalm when we were coming in. This is what the early church had in their minds. The psalms. This is what they were hearing over and over. This was their hymn book. The psalms. That was it. There were other hymns that did eventually grow up in the life of this. But the psalms were what the people knew and what the people sang and what the people heard. This is what we all sang together. And in the psalms... We hear the phrase that God is just. That is, he does give to each what is in accordance with their dignity. He gets the whole creature thing, since after all he did create it and sustain it. So when we look at the Ten Commandments, as we heard in this first reading, it's important to see how these come from a history of relationship. They're not arbitrary like a stop sign. They're about the right order of things. That is justice. Sometimes we think of the Ten Commandments as if they kind of drop from the iCloud onto our tablets, right? They come from somewhere. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. I, the Lord, am a jealous God, inflicting punishment for their father's wickedness on the children of those who hate me down to the third and fourth, but bestowing mercy down to the thousandth generation. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain. Six days you may labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. No one may work be done either by you or your son or daughter or your male or female slave, or your beast, or by the alien who lives with you, because in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested. This is a little longer than what we normally think of as the Ten Commandments, because they come out of a relationship, out of a history, out of a much wider perspective than we want to give it. Think of the Sistine Chapel. There's paintings everywhere. But if you focus on just one, you miss how they fit into the whole. (laughs) And if you go into it too often, sometimes you miss all of it altogether. You get bored or overwhelmed. It's like your kids (laughs) who wanted Kraft macaroni and cheese with the orange packet. (laughs) Like That's what we want, right? We want the orange packet. The artificial, you know, whatever. Whenever you've tried to make mac and cheese with like beautiful cheese from Italy and they just crush all the cheese up and it's just thick and rich and they pet the cow where they got the milk from to get the hand rolled. No, craft mac and cheese, please. There's a documentary out right now on truffles. It sounds silly. It's really dumb. Truffles, the, the mushrooms, or the fungus that grows in the, in the forest, not the truffles that you get from Seas Candy. Okay. Do not feed truffles to a three-year-old. They're not going to care. Okay. But for someone who's understood what this is and the different tastes of our lives, goes, ah, I can see where this comes from. This is why we have to understand the Ten Commandments in the broader perspective. This is why we come back every week with the Psalms and the same prayers. And it seems boring because we're boring. Because we don't have the capacity to understand sometimes. So we have to come back over and over and over again. Like it's so rich just at the beginning. There were three Psalms, two different readings, a selection of prayers from the treasury of the church from the last 2,000 years. If you took it all in like 
we would die of love. <laughs> the Lord is merciful. He says, come back. Next week you'll get something better too. Sometimes the justice that God has in store looks contradictory to what we might originally think. This is what some of the second reading is getting at. And frankly, I don't think the second reading does a good job in terms of the translation. And I, so I want to give some context. I'm going to retranslate that passage from the Corinthians, maybe with some language that, that strikes us a little more and gives us context from where Paul was before this reading and what he says after. Brothers and sisters, the word of the cross is certain stupidity to those who are perishing. To those, though, who have been saved, that is, us, it is the strength of God. For it is written, I make perish the wisdom of the wise, and I will reprobate the prudence of the prudent. Where is the wise one? Where are the secretaries and the professors? Where is the recruiter of this age? Hasn't God made stupid the wisdom of this world? For that which is the wisdom of God, the world has not known, which is also from the wisdom of God, so that God might be pleased through the stupidity and inadequacy of our own preaching, those who believe might be saved. For the Jews have asked for signs, and the Greeks seek out wisdom. We, though, have preached Christ crucified. To the Jews, definitely a scandal. And to the Gentiles, certainly stupidity. To us who have been called, though, Jews and also Greeks, Christ is the strength of God and the wisdom of God. For that which is stupid of God is more wise than anything the human can come up with. And that which is the weakness of God is more firm than anything of the human the human can come up with. So see, brothers and sisters, your own vocation, which is not filled with the many wisdoms of the flesh, nor the many powers, nor the many nobilities, but that which is stupid to the world God chooses so that the wise might be confounded, and the sick of the world God chooses that he might confound the strong and the unknown of the world and the contemptible of the world God chooses. Those who are not the up and coming, so that he might destroy those who are the up and coming, so that there might be no boasting about getting ahead in the sight of God by merely fleshly gains. From all of this, though, you are in Christ Jesus, who has been made, been made by God wisdom for us and justice and sanctification and redemption so that it might be fulfilled what is written. Whosoever might speak about himself well will only be able to do so by the grace of the Lord.